This is Python's Paradise. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena, straight out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And folks, here we are, May 22nd, 2022. And folks, I have a multiple returning guest. We are celebrating the... 40th anniversary of my favorite Canadian film, and I'm going to call it a Canadian film regardless. <laughs> Class of 1984. Oh, you got the Blu-ray, huh? I got the Blu-ray. And I got Lisa's signature on here. I got Aaron's signature on here. There you go. Folks. What's I the cover on that one? What's the cover on that one? Is that a drawing or a... It's a drawing, right? It's a painting. I think so. Yeah. I'm like kicking some guy or something like that. <laughs> no, you're sitting on the... Let me see if I can light this up better. There you are. You're sitting there on the car. Oh, I'm selling acid on the car. I did a lot of that. Well, this one at least has Barnyard on there. I know He was never on the original poster. I never understood that. I know, I didn't either. I didn't, maybe they just had room for him or something. But yeah, because he was such a great, uh, Keith was such a great looking character. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, folks, so. I, I give you Drugstore himself. The awesome Stefan Arngrim. How do you do, Stefan? Uh, I'm fine. You're doing fine? That's good. That's good. Well, you know what? Yeah, that was funny. You know, that's what you're well, you know what? What? <laughs> Wait, I'm, not, I'm losing you there. I didn't hear what you said. Yeah, you started to cut out on me, too. But uh, nonetheless, oh. yeah. Anyway. Oh, look at that. Oh. <laughs> that is so cool. Lisa and I went and had these done at a... Uh, t-shirt store before we went to Frightmare in the Falls. That's great. That's yeah. great. I was thinking about doing some drugstore t-shirts too with, you know, like Yep. Advice for, you know, for youth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got one and she's got one and it's beautiful. Oh, wow, and that's so cool. I just have the the black, I'm not going to get you sick mask, but wow. Yeah, let me see. Is that a patsy mask? Is that my, what I'm looking at? With the That's tongue okay. out and everything. That's excellent. I got that done at the same place. Lisa didn't get a mask, but uh, we both got t-shirts. <laughs> I've got quite a few uh, interesting masks. I got one of John Carpenter's Halloween. I've got one of the Blue oh. Brothers. I got Blues Brothers one. I got a Big Lebowski one, you know. They're interesting conversation pieces at work, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah, I got a Patsy mask done. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. That's what you need is, you know, always turn, take the pandemic and turn it into merchandising as quickly as possible. <laughs> Why, why not, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> I figure if I'm going to go out with a mask on, I might as well go in style. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Here you go. Yeah. When have you done When have you done a convention last? Oh, gee. It's been, it's been a few years, actually. It's been maybe two, three years. I think I was down at... Um, I was down in Jersey at ChillerCon last. Mm -hmm. But I think that's been at least two years. Yeah. And yeah, I haven't. I've been doing a lot of writing the last uh, the last little while. So you know, and, and uh, working on music and stuff. So I haven't really been concentrating on that. Although recently, uh, and also it's opened up a lot more. They're really, you know, the pandemic shut down things for a long time. But um, uh, I noticed that there's a lot more shows coming up, and you know. Uh, and you know, I saw like 
my friend Dennis Christopher is doing the Hollywood show. And I know he was really paranoid about doing any shows for a while because, you know, it is true. When you go and you do these conventions, part of it all is, it's not just signing pictures and stuff. Part of it is, you know, very touchy-feely, you know, give people a hug, take pictures with them, put your arm around it, you know, because... Uh, you know, a lot of people just really come to see if we're all real, you know, <laughs> they want to know. I, like, heard a, I heard a rumor that Drugstore was not afraid of the pandemic, that he had the perfect medicine. I'm immune, yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing will live in here. <laughs> you know what? Um, I've been going back to the movie theater since uh, July 2020. We got kind of the jump on the pandemic here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've had some deaths here and stuff. I never had COVID, although I was in the front lines of it because I work as a cleaner. So I was. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. So I never stopped working, but the station went into lockdown and I had like 30 guests waiting to come on my show and I was in a panic. I went the rest of the year. I wasn't able to schedule anything and, and, um, Nancy McLaughlin from Friday the 13th Part 6 Jason Lives was the one that suggested Zoom. Right. Yep. And uh, so and Carrie Yates, who was an associate producer on a film I'm a co-producer on called 13 Fanboy. She, yeah. got, me, she got me hooked up on this. Um, she was in London, England. And so she... Uh, she was on uh, online one night, and she asked, she asked if uh, I want her help breaking this in. I'm glad she helped me, because I would have screwed it up. <laughs> so um, I've been, it's kind of nice to do it like this, because I yeah. don't have to call the station to see if they, the studio's free and exactly. booking and yeah. all this. The this studio's is, always free. Yep, like this. Is, <laughs> this is nice. This works for me. Yeah. <laughs> It's working for me. Yeah. But um, anyway, uh, ha, ha, is that Tony Harris Fried's, uh, uh, Fried's hat? Which hat? The one you got on your head. Oh, no. No. No, neither is this one. No, these are both. I, I heard you're into wearing his clothes and stuff, like that uh, outfit you yeah. have. Yeah, it was, <laughs> uh, he, you know, he, he tries to take credit for that, but... You know, the fact, <laughs> no, it was an accident. I had no idea. I had no idea at the time that it, it had been at one time his shirt. <laughs> Can't wait till he gets it back. And I was like, what happened to it? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, he never got it back. It was it was shreds by the time we were finished that shoot. But it was actually, it was a lovely, it was an old, it was an Ultravox hand-painted shirt by Vivian Westwood, by, uh, who had the shop sex on King's Road in you know the mid seventies where the Sex Pistols came from and all that, so it was actually right out of that whole period. See, I had a bunch of that stuff, you know, I had all that wardrobe and stuff from, you know, from from that period. And uh, so when when uh, Mark Lester asked me to do the movie and everything, and, and man, uh, he basically it came down to he said we got this character we have no idea what the hell he's really but his name's drugstore yeah i i can't hear you During <laughs> that movie or actually or mine <laughs> I did get a wardrobe to go shopping with me a couple of times, but. Yeah, there was part way through that I couldn't hear you. I don't know what was going on there. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What part? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that was when I was I pointing at near. this. Yeah. Oh, the near. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless. Anyway, uh, I wore a lot of my own clothes, and I said it was a lot of my own dialogue, and all the whole gang was kind of like that because they really didn't have it written. So we just kind of improvised most of it. That's all. Folks, it was a lot of his own clothes, except for what he had of Tony Harris Frieds. Or Frieds. Frieds, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Only his own shirt. <laughs> oh, it was funny that comment he put on Facebook that time. 
You ever get a shirt back? <laughs> He's been living on that shirt for years. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, he, Tony and his band. Yeah, we're having a sound issue here. <laughs> year of 1981. But, but he was they were the band and they did like the soundtrack for it and all this stuff. So, yeah. 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 More so that, the sound was cutting out again there. Whenever I, when you ever see me pointing at this, it means the sound was cutting out. I don't, okay. I don't right. know what your internet connection was like there, but uh, nonetheless, it's just, Wi-Fi. it's just, I'm just pulling it out of the air. Just out of the air. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I did reach out to Jenny Wright, and she's, she's open to coming back on. She is hit and miss uh, getting hold of her on Facebook, but she did say sure about coming on here to celebrate 40 years of Pink Floyd the Wall. So, um, sure. Yep. So I'm hoping to... Uh, Jenny's shy. <laughs> I love Jenny. That is one of my top five most listened to interviews. Yeah. It's Jenny, yep. Yep. So, um, yeah, she says yes. She wouldn't, she wouldn't go to conventions or anything for years and stuff. And I remember in LA, I talked to her and I said, you know, people, I go to these things and people ask about you and they love you and eh, you gotta go. And I, so I like to think I had something to do. It wasn't just me, it was other people too. I, it was something to do with getting her out into the world again because. She, uh, she's shy. <laughs> shy? She's a girl. She there is. you go. <laughs> well, girl. well, what do you think? 40 years of class of 1984. 40 years ago. I would have been 10 when this came out. I'm going to turn yeah, 50 here. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you, if anybody had told me that 40 years later, you'd be holding up this you know, Blu-ray, I mean, you know, come on. It's nuts. I mean, I, I really think most of this has to do with the, you know, the internet and the web and, and that kind of presence because uh, I, films like that just didn't live like this, They're a, even in the great nostalgia periods, you know. It's just bizarre, you know, because, I mean, when, when, when I made the film, I sort of thought it was a little bit late myself. I thought, oh, punks is sort of the new bikers. Okay. But I, you know, I thought it was kind of passe myself. But, I mean, that's why I had all that old wardrobe, for Christ's sake. I didn't wear that stuff. I mean, I was in the back of my closet. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you know, that was yesterday's stuff. But uh, we did it, and then what? Years later, all of a sudden, it's like this, you know, big pike, punk icon movie or something. It's like, okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I got Lisa's autograph across here on there. and uh... Well, we'll have, to, I mean, we'll have to figure out how I can get to it and sign it for you. And I got Aaron Nobles on this little in card there in the back. Oh, that's nice. That's good. Yeah. yeah, I'm still in touch with Aaron. Uh, last couple times I was in Toronto, uh, Lisa and I met her at uh, a Starbucks and sat down and reminisced. And, yep, so uh, I meet her. She, she told me that she did not play the clarinet in that movie. She just held it. <laughs> really? I didn't even know that. You know, okay. what else, you know what else I heard? What? Among the many other things that um, Mark Lester apparently uh, was <laughs> going by what I heard was trying to replace her with that blonde that sat beside Aaron in the classroom. And Aaron had yeah. to tell him about it. Yep. yep. Well, I, I remember that was the rumor, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she went up to yeah. I can't. yeah boy we're having some sound issues here <laughs> yeah 
There you go. There we are. Okay. Yeah, I wonder what's going on there. Anyway, what was you saying there about the... I just said, yes, I, I remember that. And I, you know, I remember that that was the rumor going around the set and everything. I, uh, I, I sort of seen that kind of thing happen before on productions and you know, <laughs> where the director gets a, a fix on someone and wants to replace somebody else. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of cheesy. <laughs> what can you do? Aaron, Aaron confronted him about it, though, so... Uh, yeah. Good for her. People shit, always. Yeah, I like Aaron, and I was glad to have her on, and uh, and uh, that was a fun... Um, yeah, <laughs> again, we're having issues with the sound. It's not on my end. <laughs> There we go. Now the sound's back. There we are. Do you do you hear that too when it cuts out? Yeah. 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 I wonder what that is. Anyway, um, what is your fondest memory of shooting this movie? <laughs> uh, my oh, um, uh, um, gee, I don't know. I have a lot of pre good memories of doing it which is interesting because it was not an easy film to make and it was long hours and it was hard work and and um people got a little afraid from time to time but um i was really really pleased uh to be working with roddy mcdowell because he and i had known each other since i was a kid when i first arrived in in hollywood from here in new york and uh and I was under contract to MGM and I was living at the Chateau Marmont where he was living and his having been a child actor, he took a particular interest in, you know, becoming my friend and kind of almost sort of non-official guide, you know, through the maze of Hollywood child actordom. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun to work with Roddy. Uh, it was a lot of fun to work with uh, the gang, with Tim and, and Lisa and and, uh, and Neil and Keith. I mean, we had a real a real camaraderie that was very instant. There was no big long rehearsal period on this picture. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> just, they didn't have the budget for that, and uh, but we just uh, hooked up fast, and uh, and made sense. I mean, we all uh, you know we all knew each other, so that was good. Uh, um, as far as specific things, no. Oh, I remember in the big fight scene when when we were uh, fighting. What's his name? Juju and his gang. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most bizarre thing because all those guys were all these guys from Toronto. They were primarily Jamaican. Uh huh. So so we had to go, and we're supposed to be in Chicago. That's really where. Class of 84 takes place, Lincoln High in Chicago. Okay. So we had to, me and Tim and Neil and Keith, we had to coach these young Jamaican to Canadian actors on how to be badass American niggas. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> and, and we had to use, all, throw this slang back and forth. and everything. They'd never heard any of this stuff. And... Um, so that was that was hysterical. But when we had that big fight scene in that underpass area, it, it was originally it was blocked. That Terry Leonard was a stunt coordinator. Mm -hmm. I love that guy. He's just brilliant. Mm -hmm. But the way we had it set up, we were just going in, and there were like four of us and what six of them or something, and we just went in and like powdered them in the original setup. And at one point, I stopped and I said, you know, this is. <laughs> this is silly. I mean, it's somebody on our side ought to at least get hit or fall down or something. You know, I'll do it. <laughs> 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 and uh, so we just instantly, uh, Keith and I worked out this thing and uh, uh, where uh, I went down, I got hit and I went down and I called Fallon and he came over and 
protected me and got me back up. And that was interesting because late because we just sort of from there decided the rest of the shoot that that was sort of Fallon and drugstore's relationship. <laughs> drugstore would get into trouble that call for Fallon and Fallon come and get him out. So <laughs> that was kind of fun. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I um one of these trips I had to Toronto, um, Lisa and I Lisa. got to meet uh, Neil Clifford. Um, I think Neil was very, yeah, we, he was very reluctant of it, but uh, he's finally caved in, and I know he's into uh, sculpturing now and does a great job yeah. of that. But um, he called Lisa and he decided to meet us. I think this was 2018, and uh, we uh, met him at his uh, shop there, and he had some stuff in progress. And we sat down, had tea, and reminisced a little bit. And uh, I got a picture taken with him and Lisa. Um, I don't have it up online. He requested I didn't put it there, so I said sure. Uh -huh. But, um, but, um, all I know, one of the stories he told, actually a couple things he told me. Number one, he said, well, during the table saw scene, if you watch carefully, you'll notice he, ha he, he said he forgot to switch his shoes. You can see he's got white sneakers on. <laughs> oh. Yeah. 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 He mentioned that. And the other thing he mentioned is that you and he co uh, commandeered an ambulance one night. Now, you care to comment? <laughs> well, you know, see, there's a lot of waiting around when you're shooting. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and you can only read so much. And and, uh, and it gets boring after a while. If you're shooting nights, you know, Sit, and you're outside, you're sitting around on the streets at night. I think it was Queen Street. And, um, and there was this ambulance. And it was open. <laughs> <laughs> I looked over and knew what it had. And he got up and looked over and he, you know, the keys were in it. So I don't, it wasn't so much commandeered, it's just so like, you know, followed fate. <laughs> so yes, so we took the ambulance for a little, a little ride. Did you guys get in trouble? Uh, well, um, <laughs> we were just about to. <laughs> we were just about to get in really serious trouble uh, when, uh, when a whole bunch of uh, a, uh, Production assistants and assistant directors and stuff descended upon uh, the scene. We had a little problem maneuvering uh, uh, the ambulance and, and keeping it off the sidewalk. And that kind of caused, you know, some police involvement. And, uh, and <laughs> so I'm not sure what happened. We, you know, we were just sort of ushered away from there. Were you and, guys in costume? Yeah. Oh, gee, I can imagine the cop. Did you guys have the face paint on during that? No. <laughs> we, were, we, were, we were shooting one night down on, uh, uh, in downtown Toronto, and, and we were sitting all piled in that convertible, that red convertible. Love that car. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were pulled up at an intersection, ready to make a right onto the boulevard, and all down the street, this was just like uh, 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 an establishing shot of us driving down the boulevard. So there were like about four or five camera positions down the block in different places. We didn't even know where they are, and it didn't matter. All we had to do was drive down about a block and then turn. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there waiting for there's an AD standing on the corner, kind of hiding behind a lamppost with a radio, mm -hmm. waiting to give us our cue. And Fabulous 52 Division from Toronto pulls up next to us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we just we kind of just turned around and looked at him. And, and, uh, and the cop looked out the window and said, what do you guys uh, think you're doing? <laughs> 
Neil, who um, tended to get very into character, suddenly decided to turn around and say, whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> <laughs> and these two cops were out of that car so fast. <laughs> And this AD was running over with his radio. Wait, hold on! It's just we're making a movie, and uh, yeah, and again, and then and then it was and then full action, and we literally pulled away from the whole thing while the assistant director was explaining to these two rather angry uh, officers that, <laughs> that we're just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah, we got away with we got away with all kinds of crap, which which really kind of you know doesn't say a lot for the fact you know I mean just because we we're making a movie we did things that you know regular anybody else would do or if I was did not making a movie I would go to jail you know <laughs> but for some reason why you just put a camera out there and you go da 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 and everybody's like oh oh okay. It's just a bunch of those crazy people making them. I gotta tell you, I think the most powerful scene in the movie is uh, Roddy McDowell's new uh, method of teaching class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And um, I did see the other, I uh, can't remember the name of it, the other Mark Lester movie that you did with uh, Nick Mancuso. And, oh, it's begotten. Yeah, oh, yeah, that one there. You do make the same, you mentioned in another interview that we did, that you make the same sound when a gun's pointed in your face. It's like, yeah, he really does. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, yeah, that was, what, about 17 years or something apart. And Miss Begotten was shot up in Vancouver. And uh, I loved that script. I mean, I, I thought that was one of the funniest script I, I'd read in a while. And uh, I didn't even know it was Mark's picture when I first got the script. And then when I found out it was Mark, I thought, oh, this is, this will be too much fun. So, um, and uh, and then Nick Mancuso, who's a friend of mine, was also in the picture, which was great. And then uh, Kevin Dillon, who I got to know, and, and he's terrific. And, I uh, loved him in the Entourage movie. <laughs> oh, he's great! No, he's great. He's great. He's just, he's just right there. And um, so yeah, so we had this thing where he, he shoots me on the beach uh, under the the Lionsgate Bridge mm -hmm. in Vancouver. And um, and 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 this was just before like video feeds and stuff. So the director, Mark, in this mm -hmm. case, still sitting in a chair next to the camera, like. They always did. Now, of course, no, you don't, you know, you don't see any directors or producers. They're all in a tent, like about a quarter of a mile away, looking at everything on monitors. Uh, but, but at this time, uh, 90s sometime, Mark is still sitting there watching the action <laughs> go on, getting filmed, and uh, and uh, and we do this whole scene, and 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 Kevin pulls the gun out and sticks it in my face. And, uh, and we'll, there's a cut, and I hear Mark laughing, and it's kind of echoing on the beach at night. And I turn around, and he's just shaking in his chair. And I said, what it is so funny? And he said, well, I was just, you know, flashing back to like, you know, because you made exactly the same noise just now as you did when Roddy stuck the gun in your face in 1981. I mean, you had exactly the same reaction. <laughs> I said, well, you know, that's what happens when you stick the gun in my face. <laughs> Roddy didn't want to stick the gun in my face, as a matter of fact. I kind of had to talk him into the idea that he, he, was, he, didn't, he didn't like that very much. I said, no, it's okay. Just stick it right in my face. <laughs> what, what did he want to do? Uh, I don't know. He uh, he's not a, he was not a big gun fan, and and I, um, but I, I think he he I don't know. I really don't know. He just he he didn't want to jam it in my face. I think he would have held it on me. But I thought 
and and he agreed that it was better if he really <laughs> took it in my face. Oh, oh I, I thought he was brilliant, particularly yeah. in that scene, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 And we did we did that um, with multiple cameras. So actually Roddy's close up and my close up are really being shot pretty much at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's part of the same, you know, there's a, there's a master, usually how it goes is there's a master shot, and then there's a close-up, a close-up, a two-shot, an over-the-shoulder, whatever, right? But in, in terms of people's, uh, you know, setup, what they use, their shot list. Um, in this case, Mark kind of did, well, actually, this uh, the cinematographer, um, Albert, Albert Dunk, brilliant guy he decided to shoot um some of the close-up scenes uh with two cameras so that the actors were actually i mean we all did off stage lines for each other but we actually got to be working together while the close-ups are being shot which is a really a really interesting way to do to work i like that yeah um yeah, I, I love that scene. It, it, uh, I thought it was a brilliant scene. Going back to Miss Begot for a minute. What's happening with what's happening with Nick Mancuso now? Because I lost touch with him. I know he was having some health issues and whatnot online there, and uh, then he just kind of disappeared. disappeared. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, the... Actually, I talked to him in recent past, but with the last time we saw each other was maybe I don't know, 15 years ago, up uh, in BC, and uh, we did a Western thing together. Um, yeah, he's had uh, some health problems, but he's also doing a lot of stuff with. He's doing a lot of his painting and stuff like that, um, and uh, and that's pretty much all I know. Or you know, but but uh, but he is he is he is still painting a lot. Okay, and, uh, I had him on here uh, in 2016. So, yeah, he's uh, a terrific guy. Terrific guy, really. I love Nick. He's great. Yeah, but um, when uh, Lisa and I met up that first, I, I I gotta really commend her, you know, because I lived here my entire life. Hmm. She was the one that we got talking about travel, and she asked uh, what was stopping me. And she yeah. invited me to assist her at her table at Horrorama in Toronto. Okay. And I couldn't say no, but I had a lot of fears going through my head because I get homesick going to Moncton or St. John, which are only a few hours away. <laughs> and there was uh, Toronto. I'd never flown before, so that was causing me a bit of anxiety. Ah. But. I had some anxiety leading up to it. I like flying for the first time. Well, here, here's a story. Um, first off, I got to leave my car at my folks' place. Uh, my dad, I, we just, I just lost, we just lost him in uh, April fifth. Oh, after sorry. An, yeah, after an eight-year battle with ALS, but. Oh God. Yeah. Sure. But. Um, that first year, he and mom drove me to the airport so I could leave my vehicle at their place so I wouldn't have to pay to uh, leave it at the airport. Yeah. So they got to see me off. And I remember Lisa called me while I was at the, the Fredericton airport to uh, give me a few instructions. And I, I took, flew Porter Airlines, which I really liked. Okay. And uh, once I got up in the air, it was like, a, it was like taking a bus. <laughs> yeah. It felt like a bus. I actually got a rush out of it when we took off and started speeding up. And I was like, okay, okay. And, you know, we landed in um, Ottawa for people to get off and others to come on. Then we went to Toronto and and uh, I called Lisa and she, like, we landed in Toronto Island. Okay. And, um, I, I didn't take the ferry, I took the tunnel, and it was the first time I'd seen escalators since the mid-80s. <laughs> we, really? we don't have them here anymore. We used to have them, but we don't anymore. Why do you think that is? 
I know we had a Zellers downtown that used to have an escalator, but we don't have the Zellers or the escalator anymore. Um, like, we don't have subways or streetcars and stuff like that here, you know? It's just a small city, but... Right, right, right. But um, I was going on that escalator, and we got up to the top. Lisa told, uh, instructed me to get on the shuttle bus, and it took me to Union Station. Right. And, um, she met me there. Uh, she was at the, the wrong end of the building, but we finally connected, and uh, we went... To, uh, went to uh, first off, I had to drop my stuff off uh, at the uh, place uh, I was registered at. But then we where'd met. You, huh? where'd, you, where'd you stay in Toronto? Um, there's a. Uh, <laughs> I stayed in. Uh, oh, Fred, what is the name of that place? Let's just make something up. <laughs> I don't know. We went to a lot of restaurants, and I don't even remember the name of them. I don't know. Um, did, you, did, did Lisa drug you when, when you... <laughs> no, no. But, um, put, the, put this way, I wouldn't have found it unless she had uh, taken me there, so there you go. But it was uh, on a subway stop. Oh. Uh, then from there, well, she taught me how to use the subways quite well. Good. But, but um, anyway, um, oh, you're frozen. Oh well, no, I'm not frozen. I'm just kind of thinking for a minute. Um, I know I, st I, where, I don't even remember where I stayed at the when I was at Frightmare in the Falls, and that was just last October. That was in Niagara Falls. <laughs> Wow. I was going to say the tower, but was that where the other person stayed? Because one of my guests stayed at, well, the, oh, well. <laughs> but nonetheless. You need to write this stuff down, Greg. Huh? You, need write, you need to write this stuff down, Greg. Or get what? yourself a secretary or something. An EA, get an executive assistant. Well, it's not a high, high thing. On the, that was 2017. <laughs> But um, nonetheless, I went and uh, um, after I dropped my stuff off, um, Lisa had asked me if I, if I was jet lagged, if I wanted to sleep or if I wanted to get something to eat. And I was kind of in the back of my mind, why the hell am I not homesick? Huh. That was what was going on in the back of my mind is like, why do I get homesick going to Moncton or St. John, but here <laughs> I'm kind of blown away. So we met at a restaurant, and I don't even remember what restaurant it was. But nonetheless, I know I had fish and chips. I do know that. That Excellent. I remember. But nonetheless, uh, I just remembered in the back of my head that she was asking me a lot about New Brunswick. You know, okay. and I answered, you know, we didn't really talk much about the uh, business at all. Uh, her son was there, so I met him. But, yeah, yeah. But um, nonetheless, uh, all the time, uh, I don't even remember the specifics we were talking about. It's just, it was just, I'm not homesick. <laughs> so I remember getting up the next morning, and I was like, I'm still not homesick. <laughs> so Lisa calls me and she asked if I wanted to go with her when she went to get her photos. That was on Friday. Okay. And um, I said, yeah, I could help her out, but plus I could see more of Toronto. Yeah. And all the time I was there, I couldn't even concentrate on Toronto. I was like, for fuck's sake, I'm not homesick. <laughs> Maybe that's why I can't remember the, the hotel we stayed at because I was thinking about that. But so so by essentially by saying I don't feel homesick, you're feeling at home. You know what I've said. Toronto is like uh, 
my second home. In fact, I didn't want to come home. Yeah. I didn't want to come home. I had that much fun. Lisa and I went to the, the convention. I assisted her at her table, kept her photos straightened up, took pictures of her, of the fans and whatnot. I had a blast. That's important stuff. You had Vernon Wells sitting right like that to us and chatted with him when there was any little downtime. And uh, Leslie Donaldson was on the other side of Lisa, and she's been on the show a couple times. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you one of the funniest stories, though. The after party, I don't remember the name of the place, but it was a strip bar. Yeah. And uh, this story uh, had Lisa laughing so hard, she nearly fell off her stool. <laughs> but um, two of the guests there were Carl Zittier, who's a composer, and okay. Mink Stoll from Pink Flamingos. Oh, yes, Mink, yeah, sure. And they were going to sing the filthy cabaret at this uh, strip bar. Very good. And then after that was done, here, here's how bizarre this was. I had this topless girl come up to me asking me if I want any shots. And I couldn't even uh, focus on the fact that she was naked. It was just like, I'm the homesick. <laughs> homesick I I, I I would gaze but I'm thinking about this weird feeling I have I never had before <laughs> but they afterwards they got this drag queen up there and he was singing a song singing the lollipop song and he pulled this um, what is that thing that girls have to have the string on the end of it um, Tampon, whatever that is. Yeah. Pulled that out, and it was just a stuffed toy. And it had, <laughs> blood, it had blood on the end of it, but the blood was just stuffed fuzz. Right. And he swung it above his head, and it sailed across the room, and it came down, and it hit me right on the right shoulder. And oh, that's very lucky. Landed right at my feet. I look down and see it. I look up and everybody's staring at me. So I reached down, I picked it up by the string, and Lisa nearly, <laughs> she lost it. <laughs> she, and I don't know whether it was Leslie Donaldson or Mink Stolt, one of them said to me, you're not in Fredericton anymore. Oh, well, no. And Lisa asked me if I still have that. I said, yeah, I still have it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you got to keep it. Yeah. Uh, listen, yeah. To, get, to get hit by a tampon thrown by a drag queen, is that's good luck. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, there's, I, I know last time I went, I filmed a lot of uh, locations and places I went to, you know, but um, hotels and stuff, uh, completely i don't even remember the name of the strip bar i remember the royal theater that is one place i do remember because okay. uh, lisa and i attended a double screening of white and black christmas oh okay now she didn't want to go to white christmas like she wasn't with me right i just kind of called her and asked her if she wanted to attend this she wasn't interested in white christmas but she was willing to go see black christmas because uh a lot of the people in it, this was filmed in Toronto. Is that the original one with Olivia Hussey and yep. Kira Delay? Yeah. Yep. Great little movie. Yeah, I love that movie. And um, what's funny is that um, when it was um, done, the one thing that go through Lisa's head was, uh, I wonder, she wondered if Art Hindle still had the jacket. And she called him up. Oh, and there you go. He said, yeah, he did. I haven't had him on the show yet. I got to get him on, but but um, nonetheless. She'll do that. She'll call you right up, you know. <laughs> yeah. But um, none, nonetheless. Yeah. Here delay, gone tomorrow. Yeah. Here delay, gone tomorrow. Here yep. delay, gone tomorrow. But 
nonetheless, I had a blast on that first trip. And um, I and wouldn't get get homesick at all. I didn't want to go home. In fact, when I got home, I felt depressed. That's the ultimate I'm not homesick. You don't want to go home. Mm -hmm. So I went in 2018. And um, 2019, I went to, I went twice. I went to the Toronto Comic Con. I almost didn't go. Uh -huh. Because uh, Lisa wasn't going to be there. She was oh. in uh, Los Angeles. Oh, but yeah. she told me, you know, I could increase my brand and this and that, and I'd meet whole new different people. That's right. So, yeah. anyway, I went, and um, during the weekend, Lisa called me, and she wanted to see how I'd make out on my own. Uh huh, yeah. And she taught me well, because uh, I got the uh, subways kind of mastered. There you go. Yeah. But I always save my scene point. We got a thing called uh, with scene cards for the movie theaters. You go to so many movies and stuff like that, you get free yes. movies. Yes. I save all those for Toronto. Very good. Yep. So I uh, always tell Lisa, pick some movies. We'll go see some movies. Very good. Yeah. So that is my experience in Toronto. They got to get you to one of the You should. You should are you, you're going to move there. You got to move there. You know what? I like, want that's where to. you got to be. That's what I mean. You know, listen. When you feel like that, and you know you got to be somewhere, there's a reason. You know. Well, right now with the job I have, I think I might be able to save up and make that happen. Why not? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I I love Toronto. And I've made a, a lot of connections um, there. Like, not just Lisa, but I met other people from these conventions and stuff that sure. live in Toronto. So I'm able to connect with them as well. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I just can't remember restaurant names and hotels and stuff like that. <laughs> well, you will. That's why you have to go. See right there. There's reason number one. You must move to Toronto so that you can memorize the names of hotels and restaurants and things. I would primarily. But what good is using the subway if you don't know where you're going? So you need to go there and find out where you're going and then apply your subway skills. It so I, just know, I just know where Young Street is. Yes, who doesn't? <laughs> and uh, I remember when, uh, when I went to uh, Frightmare in the Falls, Niagara Falls. Um, oh, yeah. Lisa and I rented a car because there was no way I was driving down there. So I rented it. She drove. And uh, she went to stay with a friend of hers. Uh -huh. And uh, I went to, I think it was the Tower Hotel. Okay. I think that's what it was. Um, but nonetheless, it was about five, ten minute walking distance from the convention. So, uh, nonetheless, um, that wasn't too bad. And she picked me up, uh, the following day, whenever the convention was over. And, uh, that was fun. That was, yeah. a road, that was a road trip. Yes. Went to Niagara Falls and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what else we did? We did this what? the first year. We did this the first year I was there. We went around all uh, as many locations for this movie as possible. Oh, really? On Facebook, I've got a picture of Lisa and I standing in front of the school, right up on oh, the steps. It... Yep. Yeah. We didn't go inside, but we uh, we were in front of the school. What was that? Something tech, technical, uh, something. Um, uh, technical or something like that. You know what? I should know that, but something else that's not dawning on me right now. Something technical. Central tech. Central tech. Yeah, that's it. Central there you tech. go. Good thing it wasn't a hotel. That's right. Yeah. Otherwise, um, we. 
And we saw the uh, alley where um, you guys tried to interrogate Michael J. Fox and Aaron Noble. It was blocked off, though. Um, and due to the traffic, we couldn't get out on that anyway. But um, I remember I interviewed Sean Clark, and uh, who runs Horror Hollow, uh, or runs uh, Convention All Stars. He books people for cons. Yeah. And um, he uh, he said the one place thing he could not find was the house where the teacher lived. Well, oh, Lisa, yeah. Lisa and I found it. Yeah, yeah, it's not that hard to find. Oh, we got our picture taken in front of it, and there was a for sale sign on the lawn. I'm like, what happened? Did another gang show up there? Yeah, see, who wants to buy that place? I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, if I move to Toronto, maybe I'll live there. There you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Just about those, those hoods and convertibles showing up. I don't know. Um... I know there's a couple of places in Toronto I was told to avoid. One was Finch, and I forget the other place now, but um, but I've walked to a movie theater at night in Toronto, and I, I felt fine, you know, so, mm -hmm. yeah, but, um, of course, when you've had your picture taken with a 10-foot Burmese python draped over you, you're not afraid of people, you know. Thank but, you. But last year, uh, Lisa and a friend of hers and I went to uh, uh, a street Halloween party. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But um, something different I don't see here. <laughs> no, we have these those here in, in Manhattan. But I live, like, right in Times Square, so, you know. Which is like having a python draped over you all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> What's the pandemic been like where you are? Because uh, I heard New York is hard. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it's, it's been up and down and very weird. Um, uh, but then what place has not every place has been, been fucked up by this has been difficult. But... Um, the, the the uptick in violence is uh, is disturbing. Uh, it's gotten very violent here again. I mean, New York's been violent before. I remember in the '70s, this town was terribly violent, ter very dangerous. But you had some of the most extraordinary music, art, and film and theater scenes going on at the same time. You know, so yeah. Um, you could get robbed on your way to CBGBs, but at least you were going to CBGBs or Mexico, Kansas City or, you know, <laughs> the factory or so, you know, um, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of cool stuff happening. There was a lot of cool theater and there's a lot of cool filmmakers and, and, you know, I mean, the whole 70s New York New Wave, you know, guys, um, everybody... Scorsese and, and De Palm, all those guys, um, all come out of that period, along with all that music and all that stuff. So that was, that made all the, you know, that balanced New York at its worst, <laughs> one of its worst. I mean, you know, the 1860s were no joy either, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's become, um, it's very flat right now. I mean, there was a sort of Disneyfication of New York in the 90s, which was a little weird, you know, and they, they changed Times Square completely from from this really sort of fun place that you really should not hang around. And, and you know, into this, you know, um, kind of autograph show with, you know, uh, neon signs. It's, you know, it's all very hyper real. It's all very realer than real, uh, you know. And uh, and it's all sign and symbol and advertising and you know and the words mean other things than they really formally meant and you know and the pictures are all you know and it's huge and, and you know uh, but the pandemic just shut down a lot of businesses and um, it really put 
people at odds with local government and stuff, and that was too bad. But, you know, there was survival at stake. A lot of restaurants, and, and a lot of restaurants, and New York's known for its restaurants, were uh, desperate. And um, so I think, you know, like everywhere else, it's been maybe pushed a little fast in one sense, because I don't think we're really done with all this stuff. Um, but at the same time, uh, what else are you going to do? And, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't just stay in the house and, you know, and you can't do what China's doing. That, that won't work either. I mean, as a matter of fact, that's one of the worst things you can do is lock everybody indoors, you know, and disinfect the streets. So, you know, you can never do that in New York. <laughs> New York is never put up with that. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's coming around, but it's really changed. It's a changed city. And I give everybody an A for effort here. And, and they've reopened Broadway to a great degree. And and there's a, there's some good stuff on Broadway. Most of it is, you know, sort of rehashed and, and you know, and, and very safe stuff. You know, Music Man, right? I'm right across the street from the uh, Winter Garden Theater. Music Man with uh, Hugh Jackman. So then Sutton Foster and... And, you know, they're raking in gazillions on that. And, and it's great. But Music Man is very safe, very, you know, and, and, and enjoyable. And, you know, I mean, one of the reviews on the theaters, it makes us feel happy. And, you know what, right now with things being as they are and, and not just the pandemic, but, you know, what's going on in, 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 in Ukraine and stuff like that, which is, you know, bound to have an effect on everybody. It already is. And, uh, you know, things are very, and the divisions in this country, and not just this country, but European countries, eh, very, it's a very heated environment. And, uh, and I think, you know, generally people want some relief from that. So, you know, so yeah, so go see The Lion King. No, is it great art or great theater or anything like that? I don't know. But I guess if it makes you feel good, you should do it because there's damn little that does right now. <laughs> you know, how do you, but, how do you protect yourself in uh, that environment? Have you ever had any bad encounters? What, what do you mean, bad encounters? Because I would be like, well, like, actually, no, I haven't, but um, uh, but actually, um, Claire, my fiance, has had uh, a couple of encounters with people who've either, you know, yelled at her. One, we were, actually, she and I were standing on a street corner coming back from a store, and and some girl, you know, uh, walked up some little girl and, and and you know punched her in the shoulder, and then ran across the street screaming. Go ahead, call the police. I've been in jail before, and I don't care. And, you know, that's a lot of I don't care is what you hear or see a whole lot of, particularly in this town, and, and maybe in a lot of cities right now all over the world. People, you know, authorities kind of broken down yep. for a lot of reasons. You know, uh, I, I think political frameworks in different countries have caused people. I've never seen the world in such incredible doubt and mistrust. Um, of each other and governments and you know, everything. I have, no one trusts anybody or anything. And, you know, that's that's tough. <laughs> you know, that's tough when you got a disease that's killing, you know, millions of people and, and, and you've got possible political ramifications that might result in, in, in hundreds of thousands of people dying and being displaced and, you know, and, and, and what, what, what happened this week? Nobody had any baby formula. Come on, what the hell? <laughs> you know, that kind of shit. Um, so, you know, yeah, it goes back, I guess, that whole, you know, there's, Saroyan said, you know, there's, there's optimal stress, uh, minimal stress, and, and maximal stress societies. And, and um, optimal stress societies produce some art, but, you know, it's generally, you know, just sort of entertaining and it's fine and it's okay. It's not very, if it gets deep, it's, 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 it's still in the shallow end. 
maximal stress societies always produce the most art. They produce the most feel-good art and, and, and happy, make you feel good art, but they also produce the most poignant and the most, the most incisive art. Minimal stress societies, well, Switzerland, you get like the cuckoo clock. <laughs> Chocolate, you know. So, <laughs> so that, that, it's a trade-off. I mean, that's what I was saying earlier about the 70s in New York and, and other periods in, in Manhattan and in other cities around the world. You know, you get real maximal stress situations, but you have great art and expression coming out of that, out of people's frustration, anger, fear, uh, uh, or hope, uh, uh, whatever, uh, hopefully. And uh, that doesn't seem to be happening right now. We're, we're in the feel-good phase. Everybody's managed to get it together to, you know, da, 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 and put on a show and, 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 and we'll all forget about it, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but we're not really to the point yet where we're really ready to, like, look at it and, and say, okay, well, what, it, what does this mean? I mean, you know, the one thing I think is always interesting about, I've thought from the beginning of this pandemic is, is that, you know, there's so much separation right now on this planet between people and 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 everyone to some degree or another resists even people who, who tend to be proponents of a sober, sort of global village or global planet uh concept they still are slightly resistant and and some people are downright really against it and, and really feel that it's a massive conspiracy you know destroy individuality and all kinds of stuff Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's the way things are. I mean, the reason we have a pandemic is because in 2016, world travel went up by some 300%. So everybody from next door came over and we went over there. And, and, and if anything has been proven by this global pandemic, it's that we must be all living on one planet because we all got the same flu. So we can't be that different. Mm -hmm. If we can all get the same flu, why that hasn't seemed to prompt everybody to kind of connect and 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 rally together to to, to deal with this, not fight it, but deal with it, because it's an evolutionary leap. I mean, this this is a a virus is a living organism, and it's made an evolutionary leap from animals to humans. That's huge. But it's in the natural course of things. It's not a conspiracy. And we need to learn how to deal with that. And we obviously need to learn to deal with that as a global people because we can all get it. You know, no one's immune. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter what your politics are. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter. You can get sick and die from this. Just like everybody else. The bank account doesn't mean anything. I have a question um, going back to uh, class of 1984. Um, yeah, I, know, I know you're um, still in touch. Yeah, I know you're still in touch with Lisa Langlois. Sure. Are, are you still in touch with anybody else from the film? Oh, um, well, I always like to think I'm in touch with Keith Knight all the time. Uh, <laughs> he was just special. Um, no, not really. Um, uh, Tim, uh, who never really, truly, I think, wanted to be an actor. I think he was. He became interested in production and, and, and particularly directing. And of course, you know, really, that was a wonderful break he got on Sopranos. That's really taken him off in another direction. And I mean, you know, he's got a whole floor over at HBO down, down here. So, <laughs> you know, the Tim Ben Patton floor. And, you know, he's created and is producing big, big TV shows for, for HBO. So, uh, no, I, uh, we, I, 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 we, I, spoke, uh, I spoke to some people in his office while he was in England because I had a project that I wanted him to look at. But he was way too busy with his own stuff. And, you know, I understand. And uh, I said, oh, okay. 
you know, when you make that, that kind of leap in the business, uh, sometimes uh, you're not so keen on, on looking back and, you know, why bother? It's not a nasty thing. It's just kind of, well, why bother? I'm not that guy anymore. I mean, you know, and he's not that guy anymore. If you've seen Tim, he's just not that guy. And uh, let's see. And uh, Neil, of course, is uh, pretty uh, reclusive and removed from, you know, any kind of showbiz uh, connections. So, no, I haven't talked to Neil. I'm sure we'd have no problem talking if we did. Um, uh, the, 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 um, Perry, I ran into Perry a couple of times in the last 15, 10 years or something. And uh, he's fine. But we've all, you know, I, I always ran into Perry. <laughs> nothing changed. You know, I ran into him before we did that movie, after we did them. So, yeah, I think Lisa's probably the person in terms of that internal, the gang and stuff like that, that I, I've stayed in touch with the most. I'm in touch with Lisa. I'm in touch with Aaron. And I'm in touch with Mary Lynn Ross, too, uh, periodically, you know. Um, she and I talk. And uh, I know I phoned her after I got back from Toronto that first trip to tell her that I was outside her house. <laughs> The one, the one that's got the uh, for sale sign. I said, I didn't know you were selling. She had a good laugh at that. <laughs> but um, but uh, Keith Knight, um, God rest his soul, looking at three performances by him. Mm -hmm. Meatballs. Yeah, I know. Class of 1984 and My Bloody Valentine. All <laughs> very different roles oh completely yeah yeah my goodness I like he's different in all three roles oh yeah oh yeah yeah no keith is great he, he he's, he'd roll with anything i i say i think we probably had more fun keith and i together with like sort of constructing this gang mentality and like the 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 wardrobe and the makeup and costumes we we really played around a lot with that like keith and i and and uh like when they wanted to do all the makeup on us and then, you know, like we all came up with that, you know, I mean, he, he, he decided on his camouflage and I wanted an eye patch, and, you know, I mean, you know, all that stuff. So we, we had a lot of fun. Keith and I had a lot of laughs on that. He's a very funny guy, but he's very committed to, uh, to what, that's the interesting thing I think about that movie. Maybe that's why people like it. I don't know. Um, you had a lot of really good actors in that film, which which is, um, which of course I always think there's no real excuse for bad performance. I mean, I, I know so many good actors. I, I see like a weak performance in a film and I think, what the hell's a problem here? I mean, you know, there's just no, I mean, out of my contacts, I could cast movies for the next 10 years and never have a bad performance. But you had a lot of really great actors in that movie. And it wasn't a big budget film, it was, you know, and, and, um, and 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 a lot of people willing to take a lot of chances and a lot you know and, and do a lot. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of this. We know what it is. It's basically a, a little remake of Blackboard Jungle, you know, which is great. You know, it's fine. It's what it is. But um, there's a high quality of performances in that film, which is I think unusual for that genre. Um, and everybody was very committed. Everybody took it very seriously, even as goofy as it was sometimes. <laughs> it was sometimes it was goofy. But, you know, uh, we, we, we all kind of, you know, knuckled down in the end and said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this like this is really real. Like we're really here. <laughs> Lisa and I are, have, were talking, and she had an interesting theory and I never stopped and thought about this until she mentioned it, but she thinks that Patsy lived. What do you think? Patsy lived? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think she did. Yeah, I yeah. think she did. I think out of all of us, she, she, she was the one who had a chance. Yeah, I, that's like, I never thought of that before. But yeah, Patsy could have survived. It's like, I wonder what Patsy would be doing now. Oh, gee. <laughs> Probably be a caseworker again. You know? <laughs> but um, yeah, I love the lighting, the cinematography, and that uh, climax there. Like, like when the the way the hall, the darkened hallways, and the lighting 
uh, the uh, the exit signs, you know, and the stairwells, and uh, that know, was fun. You know, we had fun with that. That was a great that that whole sequence took a couple of days to shoot, and and um, it was uh, two or three days, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And I particularly loved swinging on the ropes. We swung on those ropes. We had so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, um, how like that, that was brutal. Those uh, that climax. Um, out, of the, <laughs> out of the death scenes, which one do you know? Which one took the longest to uh, film or put together? Uh, I think uh, I think Keith's because there was so much. Uh, uh, technical stuff involved we had to drop the cars and, and all that stuff and that that took quite a while to block and and get you know safety done and everything like that uh neil's took a while too that was a that was kind of a, a tough little effect to pull off the table saw thing mine was like I, this guy this guy was great my my double on that um that's what he did that that's all he did he burn gags and and uh, and it's like twenty grand a pop, boom, set him on fire, and, <laughs> and he, it, you know, and uh, I forget his name. That's terrible. But he was he was one of the stunt guys, and and that was his specialty. He was burn gags, and um, he came on. And he was you know in matching wardrobe and everything. And I asked him right away because always I said, look, what is it you have to do physically? when your your play is there because I don't wanna fuck you up and do something that, you know, that's wrong. You know, I don't want it to be mismatched. And he said, Okay, don't raise your arms. Don't put your arms above your head. He said, because I'm not going to <laughs> it's because we're gonna try to keep the fire down here, not up here. And I said, Ah, oh, good to know. So that's why I have my arms out of my sides like that. Because I know what uh, Toby was his first name. Toby somewhere. Anyway, uh, Toby explained to me what I had to do to set him up properly so that he could do the burn gag. He had to do it twice, uh, but it was so fast. I mean, he came in and we blocked the thing out in like about ten minutes, and then you know they suited him up and they gelled him up and they set him on fire. <laughs> he did it. He was awesome. Bless you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah. yeah, that was a good. Uh, yeah, that was fun. I think Keith Knight's probably. That was a lot of technical stuff. Yeah, and a lot of people involved. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, were you aware of any of the tension with with regard to Mark Lester when you were filming? Mm, well, no, not initially. Um, uh, later on, I started to kind of get the drift. It was sort of my first experience. See, I, 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 I stayed long enough in Toronto to get born, and then I moved here to New York. So, I, you know, I've never lived in Toronto. Uh, and I've never even, Class Fate 4 is the only uh, uh, show I've ever done in Toronto. And I've worked a lot in Vancouver, and a lot, and of course most of my career has been either here in New York or in Los Angeles, primarily Los Angeles. And I've worked in Europe and stuff too, but not in Toronto so much. So Toronto was my first big experience with that. And, um, and I hadn't done a lot of Canadian-American co-pros like that. Mm-hmm. Most of the stuff I'd done was uh, uh, U.S. Uh, productions or U.S. European co-pros and stuff like that. Um, at the time, what I started to see was is there was a kind of division between the Canadian cast and the and the American cast. And I'm a Canadian, but I've lived in America my whole life, and, and I'm a dual citizen and all that. And and I was hired out of Los Angeles for Class of 84 on a SAG contract, so I was technically part of the American cast, well, along with Perry and Roddy and Tim and, and uh, Maryland, a few others. And uh, 
I didn't see it at first, but then I, I started to notice, you know, our dressing rooms were at the circus where all the trailers are and everything were separated from the Canadian actors, American What's that about? And then um, I started just to hear through the grapevine about, so I don't believe that it would, you asked me specifically Mark, I don't believe it's necessarily Mark Lester's doing. I think this is endemic within the Canadian film industry at that time. Uh, I think it's changed. Uh, but I think at that time and for a few years to follow, there was a tendency on a lot of Canadian producers and unit production managers and so forth to really want to cater to the Americans and not offend them in any way and, and you know and it's tough being America's neighbor you know it, it just is and and that that was a real problem and I think Maybe Mark took some advantage of that. Maybe he didn't know he was taking advantage of it. But, 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 I mean, the production did sort of take advantage of that polarization, that ghettoization of Canadian to, to American cast. I found it really foolish and offensive. I had no experience with it, so I don't really, I didn't really enter into it. And I, I wish I'd known more about it. I wish I'd said something about it. I, I didn't. Uh, I did later on other productions where I ran into that, but that was my first experience with that. And yes, uh, uh, my understanding from Lisa and clearly from Neil um, and a lot of people in the cast, uh, yeah, the Canadian cast was not treated very well. And certainly not treated uh, like the American cast. Mm -hmm. Which, and, and again, I have to say, that's not all Mark Lester is doing. That's actually... That's he may have he and his production team may have taken advantage of that because that's what was presented to them, but it was presented to them on the Canadian end. Yeah. And that's the really unfortunate thing. That the Canadian producers or service companies that were doing co pros with people like Mark Lester were willing to sacrifice their talent in order, you know, not to offend America. <laughs> one one thing Lisa brought up I found uh, interesting um, when Roddy McDowell had his uh, scene where he was trying to run you guys down with the car uh, <laughs> she said she was nervous because of her boots and whatnot, and she was actually afraid he was going to hit her did uh, you feel that way too uh, were you nervous about Roddy behind the wheel there <laughs> no We got cut out again. <laughs> we cut out again. <laughs> we are cut out. He just, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of actor he was. If you presented him with something and he knew realistically, oh, I can't do this or someone will get hurt, he would just say so. Uh, if you presented him with something he knew he could do, he did it. And uh, no, I don't worry about him at all. And then I certainly didn't worry about Bobby Joe Hooker, who was the stunt driver, who really did a lot of the, who rolled that car and, and, and all that stuff, because I know the Hooker brothers, and I've worked with them a few times, and uh, they're just crazy, but they're brilliant. <laughs> and that car roll was a brilliant thing. That was a, uh, they did a pneumatic cannon they built into the bed, ripped out the back seat of that car, put a pneumatic cannon in, facing down and took a uh, uh, a piece of a you know telephone call mm -hmm. they took about a, a two and a half foot chunk of a telephone pole they loaded it in this pneumatic cannon bobby joe drove the car and at a certain point he hit a switch and fired the pneumatic mm -hmm. this truck mm -hmm. boom into the ground, the car goes up in the air, <laughs> and comes down, and rolls up. Okay. It's amazing. Yeah, no, I'm uh, no, I, I'm 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 really concerned with that stuff. I will tell you, I'm very pleased that finally 
technology has reached a point where we don't have to fool around with really live firearms and, and mm -hmm. switch and all that crap. Yeah. Yeah, you're cut, you cut out on the sound again. <laughs> yeah, you cut out on the sound again. <laughs> oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah, there you go. You go. Uh, I was no, going to say the situation. Speaking of which, Alec Baldwin back at that. Oof. that was well, bad. yeah, you know, um, uh, uh, I, I have to say I, I don't disagree with anything he said regarding an actor's responsibility. Mm -hmm. You can't hold an actor responsible for being handed a weapon. And, and being told, point the weapon over here, and it goes off. You can't be held responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And I've been in that position, and God knows I, I would, ne you know, it's just, it would be horrendous. However, the problem is, who is responsible? The producer. Because they're the person who hired the people who did this thing. And unfortunately, <laughs> Alec Pollan's defense as an actor is accurate but it doesn't hold up as a producer, and he is the producer of Rust. Yep. Yep. Well, so, uh, <laughs> another thing I remember you had mentioned before was uh, the scene where Roddy McDowell finds all, all the dead animals uh, in the <laughs> lab, and how bad how bad did that stink of course you were in that scene but you you um hinted oh, I was that, there uh, you I hinted, hinted you hinted that drug store was responsible that well, was the idea drug store was supposedly responsible but that was the work of of a, a demented little art uh, set deck crew <laughs> 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 who were very cool. Well, we used to hang out together, actually, uh, these uh, guys in, in set deck. And, and it was sort of an, oh, they're, they're prop makers, they're set deck, they're, you know, uh, art directors, art, you know. And, uh, and they were great guys and, uh, and all very young and, and very funny and, and good to hang around with. And they kind of liked hanging around with, like, the gang. And they kind of, you know, because they were emulating us all the time. You know, they were doing. All, and if you read, if you read some of the graffiti on the walls, it's, oh, it's hysterical. Some of it is terribly funny, and it's again the product of these guys. And they did that whole thing, and they did that whole setup in, in the lab. Yeah, the school and, wasn't impressed. <laughs> no, no, we had to kind of keep that on the down low. I mean, you know. Was. Yeah, the problem is they didn't get rid of it. <laughs> oh, gee, can you imagine the students coming back and they got all that on the wall? Well, you know, that's the problem. That's why don't ever lease your house to a film company to shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> because they'll come in and they'll just ruin everything and they'll leave. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of wish they kept it that way, because that way, you know, I, if Lisa and I had a went inside, I'd be to know exactly where everything is. <laughs> there you go. I wonder what that school looks like inside now, you know? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It, was, it, was, that, it was pretty weird. I mean, I thought, like, I was impressed by the metal detectors, because that was a really kind of new thing at the time. I mean, Not we had those. <laughs> yeah, but we had those in the movie, and that was kind of like that was almost sort of sci-fi. I remember reading that in the script even and thinking, metal detectors. That's cool. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, we already had you know nice guns, schools, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, and and. I don't know if, if Class of 84 is the first appearance of metal detectors in schools. I doubt it. I'm sure it probably actually happened in the real world somewhere. Uh, but it was rather unique for its time. I was impressed by that. I actually wanted to see like a few more things like that. But then, you know, the thing is, that the film... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, got, you got it again. <laughs>
<laughs> you cut out and froze. Cut out and froze. That was not. There you go. Oh. You had cut out and froze there for a minute. <laughs> Why'd you lose me? I don't know. You're talking about metal detectors, you know. I was oh. going to. I was going to ask though. Um, speaking of which. I don't know what the script looked like to this movie, but was there anything that uh, was shot and not used, or was there anything cut? Again, we... <laughs> See when we get some sound here. Um, on. There you go. There okay. Yeah, okay, well, the script was titled Gorilla High, um, it was about 90 pages long, mm -hmm. and um, it was a real rough, rough sketch mm -hmm. of uh, the film. Uh, there were only a real few things in there that are in the movie now, and certainly the gang, the gang was hardly written. A, a drugstore simply had a name. There was no character description. There was nothing. They just said he's there. There was no dialogue. Um, same for Barnyard. Uh, uh, Fallon had a couple of lines. They, they had no gang. They didn't know what to do. They just knew we want punks. And uh, as far as stuff that didn't make to the final film, yes. There's probably, it's not a lot. But I'd say probably four or five minutes, which is actually a lot of screen time of film that was cut. Um, because when we finished the movie, it went to the Motion Picture Association of America to get its rating. <laughs> I heard about this. Yeah. And uh, if you'll remember, there's a, a scene where we attack Mary Lynn Ross in Mrs. Norris in her house, and, mm -hmm. and uh, that scene actually went quite a bit further than, <laughs> than you're watching, than you see in the film. And I don't know that it exists. I imagine it's on the cutting room floor. But uh, uh, yeah, and unfortunately, when that uh, when that was shown to the MPAA, one of the women on the board was pregnant. And she really, really took umbrage at a pregnant woman being, you know, raped, gang raped. Um. <laughs> Funny because Mary Lynn Ross, I think, was less nervous about that scene than you guys. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But that's 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 always true. I did a film once where I played a serial killer, and I worked with this actress named uh, Alberta Maines, wonderful Canadian actress, mm -hmm. and uh, and. Uh, uh, she was one of my victims. I mean, you know, what do you do? I mean, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, I have to pull you by the hair down this trail here. You know, <laughs> terrible stuff. And uh, and she was just like, oh, no, it's okay. It's all right. You know, I, excuse me, uh, Alberta, I have to spit in your face now and hold this knife against your throat. It's okay. <laughs> what movie we were, was that? What movie was that? That was called Concrete Concrete Canyon. Okay. Uh, and but Mary Lou was much the same way. I mean, we were we were we were all very cautious of that scene. We didn't because it wasn't really written. I mean, what was written was is that we broke into the house and we were threatening. <laughs> and, <that> was, <laughs> and and we got there. We we're like, how so? You know. And so. Um, I came up with the idea, I thought, okay, let's treat this as if um, uh, we're cartoon characters, but real, you know, like, I'll be Daffy Duck. Imagine how horrible Daffy Duck would be if he were a real person. And, and you know, and, and Keith Knight was Elmer Fudd. And, and we all kind of, you know, adapted this sort of maniacal cartoon personalities. That's why I'm throwing clothes out of the drawer going, woohoo, 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 you know, all that stuff. And uh, and Keith had a wonderful line that was cut from the film where it was a big close up on him and, and he looks down over Mary and he says, uh, 
I got you now, you ignorant slut. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, uh, uh, Tim we got an X rating for that, and Mark said, no, we can't go out with an X rating. So he cut the film, got an R. I guess Timothy Van Patten was supposed to be bugs. So what was Lisa and Fa and, uh, was. and Neil Clifford supposed to be? Uh, I think I think Lisa chose Tweety, which I thought was a good choice. <laughs> okay, I can see that. And um, and I said, oh yeah, I think Neil was Wiley Coyote, as a matter of fact. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I love so, that. Yeah, so as far as like, you know, deep introspection into our character development, it really all came from Warner Brothers cartoons. <laughs> it was just the idea of how really horrifying that would be if that actually, if any of that stuff actually happened. I mean, those people are running around cutting, those rabbits and ducks are cutting each other up with chainsaws and axes and they're dropping 16 tons on each other and everything. Like that. You know, so what if that happened? And what if you had like a group of people like that? How would that be? Not good. <laughs> well, you did do one uh, kind of moral thing there. Had it not been for you, um, poor Mary Lynn Ross would have got decked with a chain. Oh, oh, well. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I, I don't remember that that came out of great, any great concern for Mrs. Norris. I think that was more that, you know, I found the makeup. <laughs> I just remember Fallon was about to, you, you, yeah. you, you know, and you go, hey, 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 or something yeah, like I, that. I think I... I, 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 I I wouldn't. I wouldn't give drugstore that kind of credit. Um, I, I don't think it was out of concern for anybody's welfare at all. I think it was just simply that I found something cool over here. Hey, Fallon, you know what? Do you, it was something like that. Yeah. It certainly yeah. wasn't. Any, <laughs> there was no shimmer of light there. <laughs> I mean, that uh, I tried to make sure that you know. I, it was it was a great experiment for me because I mean you know as an actor you know you really always have to find some redeemable quality in the character no matter and I played a lot of villains as a good god I played the Antichrist in a movie for God's sake you know I mean you got to find a redeeming quality there somewhere even if it's twisted and screwed up and everything you got to like think okay well but this poor guy thinks you know that, you know because even Adolf Hitler got up in the morning and looked in the mirror and went. I am going to save the German people. You know, I mean, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? But I must say, drugstore, um, I actually went into and I said, no, this, there's no point in even trying to do that. This character is completely irredeemable. I mean, this, just, this, is, a, this is your true waste of space. <laughs> it's just nothing but dangerous and bad news and you know, you wouldn't want him on your block. And and it wasn't easy to play that, <laughs> that kind of a human being, you know. And unfortunately, I, I guess there are people like that. Well, I love the music by Teenage Head, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, ain't, ain't, ain't got no sense. I love the song Little Boxes, which you can hear when uh, you guys are back there um, with that poor... Yeah, I heard horror stories about that, that poor girl that was stripping down, and quite frankly, I think, um, had it been me, I think you could have shot around that easily, you know, because Hitchcock did it with a shower scene easily, you know, but um, I guess that was, yeah. About, yeah. I, I think that was just a little exploitive, but you know, I mean, it is, it is fundamentally it's an exploitation movie, you know. I, yeah, I think that was a little exploitive. I mean, the idea of the scene, because again, not scripted, the idea of that scene was to show the gang in their headquarters being nefarious, you know, doing whatever it is they do. That's why, you know, I, I went to props right away and I said, you got a little visor? Because I want to count some money. <laughs> 
give me some money too. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. We all just kind of grabbed things and you know came up with things. Okay, what are you going to do? Okay, I'm going to do that. And, you know, and, and then and then I went to the nurse off stage and I said, "Do you have a syringe?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just kept coming up with stuff like, you know, like how really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a cut out here. <laughs> Another one of those. <laughs> a cut out and you're frozen. <laughs> there we go. Uh, OK, there we go. As far as the, the, the girl thing, I mean, we were just trying to, you know, make this gang as sleazy and as, you know, disgusting mm -hmm. as possibly could. The girl thing was really, that was Mark's thing. And and I don't even remember if that was in the script. But, you know, and, and that poor girl was frankly terrified to do that whole scene. <laughs> and and yeah. stripping down like that. And, and I felt bad for her. I thought, you know, God, they're, you know, there are pros you could hire. I have no problem with this. Could have been worse. It could have been me, and then that would have terrified everybody else. <laughs> yeah, well, you wouldn't have got to see. <laughs> Nobody wanted to see that. <laughs> nah, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have even gotten a tryout by Fallon on that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't crazy. I wasn't really wild about the way that all worked. But, you know, the idea was is that, you know, we were just these really bad little bastards who didn't care. <laughs> I guess it worked. One of the things I asked Neil when we sat down with them is if he still danced, because I heard that he was a uh, dancer. Uh, <laughs> and he, he said he still does, you know. Oh, yeah. But you can yeah. tell by the way he moves when he's a. Uh, fighting um perry king the way he is moving is, you could tell he was a dancer kind of like Absolutely. sandal bergman and conan the barbarian yes Just the way yes. she moves yep when she fights yeah yeah no neil was yeah neil was something else yeah he he was very good he came up with all kinds of great stuff impressed the hell out of terry leonard the stunt coordinator because he did he would come up with all these really clever like essentially dance moves and but he, he, would, he would just end them with like you know a boot at someone's head you know <laughs> it was great it was very clever i mean it was a guy who really knew how to use his skills you know he had the skills as a dancer and he had no problem translating them to this character to this goofy little movie do you do you have this blu-ray no i don't have the blu-ray no Oh, yeah, you should get it. We never talked about Al Waxman, too. How, how cool was that? You know, he was in and out fast. Yeah, um, yeah I, I we really had no scenes together. We had just that one scene where, where we're standing there in his office in front of his desk, and he tells us to go. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, so, you know guys better than you, and tells us to get out, and, and we leave. And, uh, and by the way, that's one of my favorite wardrobe uh, changes in the whole movie, but it only lasted for that one scene walking down the stairs outside. And down. Was, I, yeah, was, I really, I wanted to wear that outfit again, but you know, I, I felt like nine changes in that movie. <laughs> it's ridiculous. What about um, uh, Michael J. Fox and uh, Joe Kell? Have you seen them since? Uh, uh, Michael, yeah. Uh, over the years, I've run into Michael here and there, and um, and I guess about um, well, in two thousand and nine, my father died of Parkinson's disease or complications due to Parkinson's, and and I had uh, I, I went up to Vancouver. I had lived with him for about two years while he was dying, and uh, and and we got sort of reconnected to Michael through that and uh and then when my dad passed away and all of that you know um uh yeah so yeah we've we've had we've we've had we've crossed paths over <laughs> over the years <laughs> and, well he kind of owes you guys because uh you know he would <laughs> never have been able to deal with the hoverboard gang and back to the future too if it wasn't for you guys 
<laughs> I, I, owe, I owe Michael $200. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Joe, Joe Kell on that flag, um, I, um, you know, I'm like, was he auditioning for Superman 3 and it just fail on him? <laughs> I don't know, why, man. That was a really, that was a bizarre little scene. I, I didn't even know we were doing that that day and we were up on the stairs watching this thing. And Look at that. Know. Oh, yeah. Look at Skittles. Yeah. What's the cast name? Skittles. Skittles? Yeah. Excellent. Skittles. Black, uh, black and white cat named after the most colorful candy. Yeah, does that make sense? There you go. Yeah, well. Skittles. He's Skittles. He came over here rubbed against me. I'm like, Skittles, this is Drugstore, a.k.a. Stefan Arngram. Oh, well, there's Skittles. It's good to know you. Skittles is like, <laughs> I'm all painted up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also have this. What's that? I can't You're see no it. Evil. Oh yeah, is that the Blu-ray? Yeah. Yeah, that. Now see, now that was fun because I got to do a, a video commentary and then I got to do an audio commentary on the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really glad because because um, so many people have told me so many weird stories about the movie, <laughs> and I was just really glad to have the opportunity to like you know kind of tell my version of, you know, and, and talk about it a little bit. And even then they cut some of it. So, you know, what are you going to do? But, uh, yeah, that was a very strange little movie. <laughs> well, so you're probably never going to be asked to play basketball again. Uh, no, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember the story you told about that poor guy stuck up on that wall while everybody went to... Uh, <laughs> God, yeah. What was that actor? Paul. Paul something. Very nice guy. Very good actor. And yeah, they, um, uh, and if you've seen the film, you know, he gets in this battle ball thing. He gets slammed with the ball and it throws him up against the wall. And, well, it's a whole rig. You got to wear a harness and, you know, there's a cable attached and they pull you back, you know, through this thing and high in the wall and you know and everybody broke for lunch and left him sitting there in the rig i walked into the gym to go to, to go to lunch i saw paul sitting there i said what happened he said they left to me <laughs> i had to go out and get a production assistant to get him like a plate and bring him in some lunch and feed him there because they didn't nobody was going to unhook him <laughs> Yeah, were you nervous at all about doing the nude shower scene? Because uh... I didn't have time to be nervous. Let me tell you, I <laughs> <laughs> I, arrived, I I flew in from LA to um, well, let's see, we flew I guess into Laguardia, and then we took a short hop on a, like a dash eighty up to Rochester, right around. Rochester, so. mm -hmm. and because uh, that's where we shot a good bulk of the film. Then we shot the rest of it at Alexandria Bay, further up the state of New York. And um, I met Danny Eden on the plane. Uh, <laughs> we had never met before. We met on the plane to Rochester. We had this brief, like, little press thing when we arrived. The local stations came, blah, 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 question and answer, media thing, you know, because Frank was from Rochester, so he was making use of, you know, hometown connections to make this movie. And, you know, local boy makes good. And uh, the next day, we, we arrived at the school to shoot what we thought was this parking lot scene. And, uh, and Frank came to us and said, um, we've had to switch the schedule. We got to shoot the shower scene. That was our first shot. We didn't even know each other. And uh, this was uh, this was like August, and the school had been closed since June, and the boilers had been off. Oh, well, that so, makes it worse. <laughs> so if you see that lovely eerie blue cast to our skin. <laughs> in the movie that's that's not makeup 
that's because the water was ice cold. And, uh, and that's why everyone's suffering from serious shrinkage, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> and yes, that's the first scene we shot. It took uh, uh, all day. It took, it took probably a good 16 hours to shoot that whole scene. Yeah. It's in cold. And, and Danny and I, who just met on the plane the day before, you know, had to do this whole, you know, like strange homoerotic kiss thing you know, naked in the shower. I really don't know. If it hadn't have been the first shot, if I hadn't have been thrown into it, and we had that, you know, Danny had talked about it later. It was like, and, and none of those other guys, those other guys were all local guys that were hard. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. And all of a sudden, boom, they're in this thing. I think if that hadn't happened, I probably would have had problems. I would probably would have had reservations or been nervous about it. But it's just it's just one of those things about filmmaking, you know, that works out sometimes that way, where you know, just uh, you have to do this now, and you don't have time to think about it and go, "What am I crazy?" <laughs> and actually, that scene, um, <laughs> that that scene is singled out in a, a coffee table book called uh, something about the greatest. The greatest homoerotic <laughs> in American film. <laughs> it's great. It's just like great, like queer nation book about you know, and that yeah, and that scene's in there. It's just because there's a bunch of naked guys and the kiss, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Were you nervous about doing the kiss? No, we didn't. You know, it was all the same. It was like. We got to shoot this. We got to shoot this now. It was like we started it, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, and and it was freezing cold, and it was like, okay, we scrap wardrobe, give me the terry cloth robe, and you know, and and we did it. We just did it, and uh, and then at about midway through the day, that we got in all these angles, and Frank said, well, let's go, let's run one all the way through, and we'll go and we'll do the kiss. And that's the first time we did that. And, and Danny and I both went, okay, <laughs> fine, rolling speed, okay, action, boom. And we did it, you know, you know, without talking about it or thinking about it or discussing it or, or anything. We just did it. And I think if we had spent any time on it, we would have, you know, screwed it up and made it really, you know. You know, I really love, uh, there's another film you did, I really love, The Strange Days. I wish your part was bigger in that. I know you mentioned a lot get cut, but but um, I love Strange Days. I think that was terrific. I'll tell you, when I read that screenplay, first of all, it was by James Cameron and Jay Cox. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't, I mean, yeah. and, and I read that my agent sent me that script, and, and, and I read it, and I said, uh, yeah, I want to do this. This is really, this is brilliant. And it was right after the whole Rodney King thing in Los Angeles and the riots. And a lot of the movie was really kind of based on on, on that. Um, because, you know, you got these guys who get stopped by the police and they get shot by the police. And, and, and uh, uh, the girl who's in the car escapes and she actually manages to record it, you know, in virtual reality wearing that squid net thing mm -hmm. and it was just such a great idea and then uh and and i was playing this character skinner who was a dealer in in uh in uh, virtual reality programs and uh and uh, i'm not sure why they cut it um i think i probably would have cut there was like two subplots in the movie that like you know, where they, they explained the whole thing with the squid nets and the VR and all that stuff. And I was in a lot of that. And, uh, but it kind of did take it off in another direction. I think when they got it in the, Catherine Bigelow directed it. I think when they got it in the editing room, it just it went too far off. But it was a lot of fun to do. And I, got, and I worked with Rafe Fine, which was great. And, and, and it was funny about that because I hadn't seen uh, Schindler's List. Mm -hmm. I hadn't gone, and and uh, so I'd seen him in the Comoran uh, for uh, Thames Television, 
I loved him in the Grand Budapest Hotel. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't really know his work all that well. And uh, so we, you know, so we had a pretty good time. And it was very easy, you know, to work together. And then right afterwards, like about two months later, I, I, I saw Schindler's List. And I thought, Man, I'm really glad I didn't see this before I did this. <laughs> because that would have been intimidating. Because that performance is so extraordinary. What were your memories of Juliette Lewis? I loved it when she sang that solo. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I love Juliette. She's great. She's great fun. Uh, she was uh, uh, on that movie. That was my first experience. Was walking on set and seeing Juliet sitting on the stairs of uh, her dressing room, and she jumped up and announced it was her birthday. You know, and we, so we had a big party on the set that night. Yeah, we go. shot a lot of that in downtown LA, and then we did the, the ending thing. Uh, it was uh, where we had three nights. We had at the Bonaventure Hotel downtown. Um, we had ten thousand dress extras for three nights. It was insane. I mean, we had there were drug overdoses. There were you know, it was like Woodstock or something, you know, in downtown LA. It was insane. But yeah, Julia was great, uh, and there were a lot of really great. Mike Wincott was in that. Michael's a wonderful actor, and a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. Somebody wants to talk to you. <laughs> Knock at the door. I'll be right it's back, like kids. A, yep, I'll just I'll just give it a pause. Okay, um, I wanted I wanted to ask about um, working with Robin Williams and the final cut because um, I was watching the trail. I haven't seen that film. I'm watching the trailer before coming on here, and I'm like, kind of puts me in mind of his work in One Hour Photo, which I did love. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, I was so sad when we lost Robin Williams. I always liked him. Well, yeah. I I for I think I met Robin first in about eighty two or something like that because my dad was managing a lot of comics and so we were at the comedy store a lot of the time seeing people and then I did I did a performance at the comedy store with uh, this uh, uh, artist named Johanna Lynn. we did this very bizarre act we did it a couple times but I got to I got to know Robin and. Um, and he was uh, he was an incredible guy. When we uh, when I was doing I was up in Vancouver and I was uh, I was shooting uh, Chronicles of Riddick with Vin Diesel and um, and and this guy uh, Omar Naim, this young he was like 24 years old Palestinian director had written and was going to direct this movie Final Cut for Lionsgate. And I went to go see him, and I, I loved the story so much, and I really liked him. And when I found out Robin was doing it, I just said, oh, yeah, you know, I'll, whatever. <laughs> you know, whatever you got. You got something? I'll do it. And, uh, and then there was this big hassle because Universal wouldn't cut me loose from Chronicles to do Final Cut. And it was stupid because we were sitting around. I was sitting around at home getting paid because, I don't know, they burned down a set or something like that, or they, you know, they threw out the script and started rewriting on Chronicles. I mean, that went on. That, that, they had like two and a half million, you know, million dollars or something, you know, big popcorn movie, and, you know, $250 million. Uh, they could do anything. They didn't care. So we, we, was, we sat around for months, you know. I, I was at home and, and uh, uh, waiting for a call, and they wouldn't release me. I would probably, you know, I was looking for maybe a week, you know, to do Final Cut. Because uh, Omar wanted me to play this character, Oliver, the spidery man. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I thought that sounded like a good idea. I took it sight unseen. I said, yeah, sure. I'll do it. So, uh, yeah, it was wonderful. I had a marvelous time. I, I loved Robin, and, and I thought he was brilliant. And I was so pleased to be working with him in a dramatic venue. I mean, we had so much fun off camera. He was hysterical, of course, as he always is. But boy, when we got in there and, and camera rolled and he just dropped all of that, he went into that. 
he was that guy. And it was wonderful. It was it was very scary, it was like for a moment, but it was good for me because it was like gave me something to react to and everything. And um, yeah, I liked that movie a lot. I thought Final Cut was a good film, and it was funny. It's a good example of that thing that you get a lot in this business where you do a movie and and you know you never. I don't care what anyone says. You don't know if it's going to be any good or not. Not really. Because there's so much involved. You're just the actor in the movie, you know. It, 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 there's tons of people involved, and, and it all takes place really in editorial and post production. So you don't really know. You hope it's going to be good, but you don't really know. And, uh, uh, with <laughs> you know, Class of 84 was one of those things. It was like, I hope this works out because it's a lot of fun, but, you know, which you, you know. But, Any uh, memories of uh, Mira Servino? No, Mira and I didn't work together. Oh. We, we we had lunch together on a couple of days, and she was charming, but we didn't we didn't have any scenes together. No, oh, I was like, her. yeah. It was just Robin and I worked together because uh, he he finds me because he's cutting you know people's lives up. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah, you're cutting out again. <laughs> You got cutting out again. Yeah, there you go. And then you start, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's very scary, but I love the movie. And at the time, all my friends and everybody who knew about it said, oh, this is gonna be a great film. This is like a Blade Runner science fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, when it was released, there were some problems. They had some, they had a bunch of problems. They had some technical problems because it actually was, one of the first movies that was released digitally in theaters, there were, that didn't go in cans, it wasn't projected. And they had problems with that. And then they had some problems with the, the Berlin Film Festival and they lost the print of the film. It was a bad release. They had difficulty with it. Mm -hmm. And so the film didn't do what I think it probably should have done if it had been seen. But all those same people who, who are friends of mine and people I knew who, who told me what a great movie this was going to be all came around later and said, well, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, and they, the script needed work. <laughs> I knew that wasn't going to work out. They needed to cast somebody. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, okay, you knew. <laughs> well, tell me this. Before we got cut off there, you were talking about your role in the film, so... Uh... Real Italy, right? Lead right on that. What in Final Cut? Yeah. Uh, I I play uh, uh, Oliver, the Spidery Man, and uh, I'm I'm. What, he's an editor who edits the lives of people who've died. That's what Robin Williams okay. does. Mm -hmm. And so what he does is the future. What, what they do is that everybody is implanted with this little device at birth that records every moment of their lives. And when they die, all that footage is taken and given to a cutter. Robin works alone. He's one of the few that works by himself. And he takes that footage of somebody's entire life, everything they've ever experienced, and he cuts it into a format that can be shown at the funeral for everyone to watch in a screening room, and also placed on the headstone that will run continually, theoretically forever, showing the best parts of this person's life. Now, there's a whole movement in the society at the time that's very against this, headed by James Cavazio, mm -hmm. um, who want this stopped because they feel that this is, you know, <laughs> this is like a, a bit much for media. And the fact is, is that what Robin has is he has this very rich, powerful man he has his life in front of him. He's, he's supposed to cut it and make a beautiful film. And what he finds when he looks at it is, is that this is not a nice man. This is a man who molested his daughter and, and who embezzled money and who arranged for people to be killed, you know, and did all sorts. But he knows that. And he has to, they want him to cut that out and just show this wonderful guy. And that's what he's faced with. Well, along this in this process, he looks at this footage of everything this guy's seen, and he finds some stuff that relates to his own past, including my character. And he knows that he can go find me and, and get a gun. I'll have a gun. 
and that's how it happens. It's a wonderful, it's a very interesting film, and then how it ties into his whole past, because there's this, this event that occurred in his past that sort of made him who he is. And uh, a kid who he was playing with, he thought, died while they were playing, fell in a, in a big uh, building, abandoned building they were playing in. He thought this kid fell and to his death, and he ran away and never told anybody. And he finds out through cutting this film that it didn't really happen quite like that. <laughs> so that was a wonderful idea. Okay. Well, I can- well, I noticed through IMDb um, you haven't done any uh, anything since uh, film wise since 2015. You did some episodes of Fargo. Um, what's been happening since? Well, um, yeah, it was two. Uh, it was three Fargos actually, and then a Minority Report or something. And then I I moved down here from Vancouver to Manhattan and. Uh, uh, I've primarily been concerned with writing and, and producing. And uh, uh, my partner, a producer up in Vancouver, I've worked with on several pictures. Uh, she and I have a, uh, a development company that uh, we control a bunch of different properties. Uh, most of them are mine, unfortunately. And uh, so we're packaging those for, for development now. And I also came here because of... Uh, uh, my, my fiance, Claire, she was here, so mm-hmm. this was the place to be. And uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, I've been, uh, uh, I've had a couple of projects that came up with people wanted me to do something in, but then something happened and their money fell apart or something like that. You know, and I always tell people that, you know, um, I, bo- I borrowed this from, from, from William Macy, uh, <laughs> who said, you know, and said that, uh, you know, don't show me your script, you know, because I, I do, or if, if you, you show me your script, but do you have the money? Because if you don't have the money to make the movie, I don't want to read your script because I don't want to fall in love with it and then find out that you don't have the money to make it. So, you know, so yeah, I, I, I'd entertain any offers from anybody, but it's got to be something that's going to get made because otherwise that that's madness because you, you know you read these things sometimes they're wonderful beautiful projects and they'd be so much fun to do but they're not going to get made mm-hmm. <laughs> well i know i i know you were uh doing music uh i heard cadillac christmas i remember uh claire had sent that to me uh a few years back and uh uh talk about how that's going oh um well, that that stuff you heard is is really the product of a, a band uh, that I had in the late '80s and '90s, the Knights of the Living Dead, and um, and actually, Cadillac Christmas was a song we recorded in my house, and we we kind of did it to break our our record deal at the time, <laughs> and it worked. Uh, but. Uh, no, I've been done, you know, I've been working on a lot of different stuff. I mean, my goal right now, if I am, you know, is I'd like to uh, I'd like to work with other artists. I'd like to produce some people or produce with some people. And I'd like to do some stuff for film and um, and and song placement in, in I, I like television a lot right now, particularly limited series and things like that. I think that's a great format. And so a lot of stuff I'm writing is for limited series format for streaming television. I like this whole thing of binge watching and people are why, you know, big, big pieces. You know, you get to make like a, you know, a 13 hour movie and show it in one hour segments. I like that. So, uh, so that's what I'm doing. And music's coming along right now. I've been waiting. I, I just, I'm waiting for something to come along and, I'm not sure what it is, but I know I want to do something kind of different, and um, I just haven't decided what that is yet. I'll, I know, I know what will happen is I'll just you know I'll hear it one day, it'll play in my head, and then and then I'll have to run around trying to like capture that, <laughs> or then I'll have to go through all my records first and find out if like that has actually been made before, and I'm just you know regurgitate it. If it hasn't, then then I get to that. Yeah. Now here's a deep question. 
Ooh. Out of all of your uh, um, career in acting, is there what is there ever been a moment where you were on a, a film and and uh, you just felt like this is the worst experience? I should not be here. Are you are you where you have a regret, either doing a film or or a scene in a film, uh, anything like that. Well, to the first part, pretty much everyone. Uh, <laughs> at some point, pretty much everyone, I think. What the am I doing? What? <laughs> I should have done this. This was a bad idea. And, uh, and but then it goes away. Uh, regret doing the scene? No. No, I don't have any regrets about anything. I, I, I. You know, I, I, I've always worked on a personal best basis. I, I'm not in competition with anybody. So I accept myself. So so when I look at my work, uh, I, 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 actually, I only watch my work when I when it's something that, that was new or different or I got to try something differently, do something different. I want to see, did that work? If it's, if it's just me doing what I do <laughs> a lot of the time, Nah, I don't need to see that again. I, I know what that is. I've been watching that since, you know, for like 60 years. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I don't have any regrets about it. I, I think, I I really do. I, I mean, you know, at the risk of sounding, you know, egotistical about it. It's not egotistical. It's just I work real hard at it. And I, 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 uh, I think that, you know, I, I've done some stuff that I think are, is real are real pigs, <laughs> but I have to say I'm happy with what I did in everything. <laughs> I really am. I'm like, oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> That'll work. Okay, let's go the opposite. What is your, if you was to pinpoint, what is your one greatest experience doing film or TV? Oh gee, you know, somebody else asked me that recently. It's hard to pin down because there's such little moments that are important, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I can think of, of probably I could go on all night talking about, oh, yeah, well, then there was this one time and then, uh, and then, you know, because see, like my memories of these things are very different than anybody else's. I mean, I look at this stuff and I, I, I don't necessarily see what, what you're seeing. What I see is what was happening to me at the time or to other people that I'm working with. So I remember it in in a different context i remember it like it was i sick that day or what you know or whatever um the best well um i was doing it uh, when i was a kid i was doing a show and we had to work um we had to work uh, uh right up uh, into uh, up to christmas and my birthday is on december 23rd and I, I think it was about eight or nine years old. And uh, and nobody said anything to me. And I was like, you know, and I was just doing my job. But inside, I'm eight, nine years old. I'm like, oh, it's my birthday. And then the end of the day, we wrapped. And all of a sudden, the entire cast and crew came out with this big cake with candles and sang happy birthday. And, and I had a big birthday party on this that was great, you know, at the time. That was, a, that, that was a fond memory. And then, you know, I mean, like I said, there's so many of them that are really, that are really good. I, I mean, the things that for me that I remember too is like when, when I really nail something, you know, when it, like I'm doing something and I, I'm really just right there at the moment. It's just, it's all, it's all very real. And, and, and I feel like everything I did was right. Uh, I didn't even have to think about it. Just all started have, you know. I think back on those sometimes, and I go, "Yes." <laughs> like, like answering the question Roddy asked you in that classroom at gunpoint. You know, there was yeah. there was there was a chance that you might have been able to, um, you know, get a passing grade. <laughs> <laughs> Drugstore might might have had a possibility of graduating. <laughs> I did answer it correctly. I mean, my God. Hey, thanks. Yeah. I'm not listening. I'm listening. 
When you do the conventions, what's the most unique thing you've ever been asked to sign? Is there anything that stands out that was just bizarre? Uh. Oh, gee, you cut out again. <laughs> oh, I cut out again, just as you, you, um, yeah, you cut out again. <laughs> Oh, see if it comes back the sound. There you go. Uh, it, you cut All out. Right. Okay, I'm, there we go. Let's try her again. Uh, no, I don't. I can't. Um, what was it again? <laughs> well, <laughs> like when you do the conventions, I like asking this oh, oh. about the most unique or bizarre thing you've ever been asked to sign. Yeah, I can't think of anything that really stands out other than, you know, people bring me like really interesting foreign posters for films and stuff like that you know, mm -hmm. if you're no evil in greece and stuff like that and that, that those are kind of fun but um no any particular item no i can't think of anything i mean most of the time it's just the pictures or posters or things like that i mean i'm sure people get some weird stuff but I, oh yeah Do i you can't ever... think ever sign anybody's skin because i hear that a lot and then they get tattooed on them Oh, uh, yeah, I, I've been asked to do that a couple of times, and I'm a little reticent to do that, um, particularly when I found out about the tattooing bit, I thought, you know, mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so uh, um, I forget, I, it's only happened a couple of times, really, but uh, yeah, no, normally I think I just do the same. Yeah. yeah. A picture won't wash off in the shower. Why don't you take one of those? <laughs> Whatever. Well, I hope that they get you to a convention up here, you know. Um, I did speak to, um, like, class of 1984 is going to be 40 this year. So I'm, I'm, I don't know right now, knock on wood, I'm hoping I got Lisa booked for Horrorama, but... I've been throwing it out there that, you know, they should get you there for that. I mean, that would, that sure. would be great. Yeah. That's always a fun con to do. And, uh, and when is that one? Horrorama again? Um, the first weekend in October. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. And then oh. there's Frightmare in the Falls. It's the last week in October, but they got that booked up right now. I was trying to get Lisa in on that, but uh, Lisa been so busy she wasn't able to get back to the promoter about it. Oh yeah, they yeah. booked these so far in advance now. You know, I mean, it's become like a real cottage industry. How many yep. do you do a year, huh? Oh, I haven't, uh, like I said, I haven't done any in a few years now. Uh, last one I did was about three years ago. Uh, it was uh, Chiller, I think, here. Um, I don't like to do too many of them, um, just because uh, um, I, I just don't, I, I don't think it's good for you to, you know, <laughs> too much of that. And then, and then also... Uh, uh, on a on a, a personal and just a purely economic level, it, it drives down the price. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I remember when I first I stayed away from these things for years and years and years. The first one I ever did was like in two thousand and three or something, and it was here, and uh, I came in, and the rest of the cast from Land of the Giants was was still we were all still alive, and now it's just me and Gary. Heather, but but everyone was there with the exception of her. Kevin Hagen came instead, and and but there was this really funny thing. Um, we had a suite, you know, tables around the suite, and everybody was at their tables, and I was at the end, and there was a big line going down the hall, coming in, going to the tables, and all these people were coming past everybody else, coming to my table and bringing me these cast pictures that had everybody else's signature on them but mine. <laughs> <laughs> Because because everybody else had been doing conventions and I wasn't, so so I was signing, signing all these, filling in my name and all the unfinished work. Of, you know. But uh, so yeah, I I, I just uh, I mean it, it's fun. I like it. I like to you know to, to meet meet people and and uh, and talk to everybody and everything like that. But you know I don't want to you know I don't like to turn into like a 
a thing like this and that. This is what I do, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you know. <laughs> I'd like them to get you and Jenny Wright up here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to send uh, Jenny another message. She said, sure. So uh, I'll have to, I'll have to pin, oh, down yeah. a, pin down a time to get her on here, you know. But um, this has been a lot of fun having you come on here and reminisce. And, uh, you know, it's been a while. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is your fourth time on here. My God. Yeah. We're yeah. on a semi-regular again. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I always wind up being a semi-regular. <laughs> there you go. There you go. No, I I've enjoyed this. And I'm glad that we got back in touch. Um, because I know I sent you a message on Facebook, but um, but um, I don't know whether the message got to you. So so I fired Claire a message about it, and then that uh, hooked up, and I was like, okay. So we're able to make that work. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I'm not as up on my, my Facebook stuff as I, you know. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I do check and stuff. But, now, you know, at least we're back in touch. I'm glad we are. And, yes, thank you, Greg. This is fun. Oh, I always enjoy it. talking to you. Yeah, I love talking to you. Um, where can people find you? You get a web page or anything like that, especially with your music and whatnot, uh, to where you can promote that? Well, um, the only web page I have is part of uh, the Irwin Allen Irwin Allen News Network thing out of England, which is uh, if you put in stephanargram.com, you'll you'll get it. It's a little out of date. It's been a few years. Uh, my music is kind of scattered around over the web, but if you go to Reverb Nation, which is an interesting uh, page, uh, I have a lot of tunes up there. Uh, Reverb Nation again, backslash Stefan Arn Group, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you know I, I try and keep a reasonable profile on on the web and you know FaceTime and I mean Facebook and in, in, uh, Instagram and stuff like that. And uh, as I'm getting more into the production end of things and the prom promotional end of things too, it's been really interesting. I've been, you know, doing a lot of work on all of that, and, and particularly this show I'm working on now, which is all very, you know, black hack hackers and you know, deep web dark. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got another cutout again. <laughs> We got another cutout again. <laughs> yeah, we got another cutout. Let's, there, there we go. go. Oh. Right. Yeah, so if you check it, you just check it. You know, run my name through Stefan Argum. Reverb Nation slash Stefan Argum has uh, some fairly recent tunes and some old ones too. And um, like that, I'm around. <laughs> I'm not that hard to find. Well, you know what? If we could put it together, I think what would be great if um, we get you and Lisa, um, Aaron, if she's interested, and maybe Mary Lynn sure. Ross or some people like that, and do a class of 1984 reunion here on Zoom. Why not? I'll I'll, I'll see. You know, I'll see. I'll see yes. what I can get arranged for that because I think that would be fun. Why not? Sounds good to me. Let's do it. Yeah, sounds good to me too. Before I let you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? No, not at all. Okay. Just just state your name, that your drugstore celebrating the 40th anniversary of this, and say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. All right. Go for it. Hi, this is Stefan Arngrim, a.k.a. Drugstore the class of 1984 and we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year uh, here at Greg Gilbert's Python's Paradise the class of 1984 I love this film <laughs> since the 80s I can't believe I'm talking to you folks from this movie because I remember when I first saw this you know it's like this is just priceless so uh, 
I've interviewed five people from this film, you know. That includes Gord Lewis from Teenage Head, so. Yeah, yeah, that, that was great, man. That, actually, that club scene with them it was, was one of the highlights of that film. We had so much fun doing that. Yeah, it wasn't a highlight for Lisa. She she ducked out of sight because she, she, apparently the punkers were, uh, punk girls were threatening her, so she ducked out of sight in that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, the, the guys threatened me too, but that was okay. I just punched them. <laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> well, I thought it was funny. Uh, Neil Clifford goes in there and just grabs and throws some guy off the couch or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. We fought with everybody. It was hysterical. We came in there and just started punching people and kicking them. And, you know, and then I, I, I was riding in on Neil's back, smacking people in the head and stuff. <laughs> it was a real little punk club that we found actually that was uh, uh mark didn't know and they didn't know where to do this whole scene and so i think it was uh keith and i uh found this club and um uh, and we found all these punk kids and made sure that they were invited to come down and all that stuff and, you know. and it was fun well you guys were an actual fight there or like uh no, it was just a big mosh pit, man. You know, we, okay. you know, everybody okay. was jumping on everybody, and yeah, there were some blows traded, but uh, it was all just in fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, every time I have you on here, it's always a lot of fun, and I hope to have you back uh, again at some point. We need to stay better in touch, but uh, you got to get yourself a, a drugstore shirt. Look at that. You know, I was thinking about that. I really do. I want to, I want to do a, a good drugstore shirt. Maybe a couple of them, you know, words of wisdom from drugstore. You, you could have one uh, where he's on f that still shot of him on fire, and underneath it says, drugstore, not here. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, not here. Not here. Only you can prevent drugstore fires. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not here, yeah. yeah. That, that, that was your line right there. Not here. Yeah, not here. And I wasn't a lot either, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Oh, gee, it's almost one thirty here. I got. Oh, I'm, my I'm, God. Yes, it is. It's getting late. Victoria, All right. day, Victoria day tomorrow. Really? Oh, yes, that's right. Well, you, guys, you, you guys don't celebrate that? No, we don't. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know what you guys celebrate. Actually, if it wasn't for work, I wouldn't have known it was a holiday. People were talking about it at work. I'm like, oh, really? This long weekend? <laughs> <laughs> it, which really is strange because I worked uh, yesterday and I worked uh, today. So, so much of a long weekend for me, you know. Right, huh? I'm making good money at it, so no complaints. Wow. There you go. Yeah, well, it's money that does that. It softens complaints. Well, <laughs> I had to get a job, to get a better job, because Skittles would not get himself a job. Yeah. Skittles uh, wouldn't what, get a job. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, Stefan, this was a lot of fun having you on here. Right. Anytime you get some new music, uh, feel free to send it my way, you know, and... Okay. Uh, Yep. Um, if I'm doing, doing a live show some night at the station, I could uh, play it so people can hear it. And um, All right. Yeah. You All right. Know. I'll, yeah. Uh, I'll pitch a couple of YouTube videos or something. I think there's a couple on there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, uh, is that Tony uh, Harris Fried shirt you got on? No, no. no he doesn't no. wear Steve McQueen shirts? No, no, he doesn't. No, but doesn't have his name on it. He doesn't wear it. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wish him the best. Um, I he's doing much better. He's doing much better, by the way, for anybody who knows. Yeah, he's feeling a lot better. He was having quite a time there for a while. But, yeah. Uh, he's doing good. And he's even playing again now and stuff and playing with some guys in Europe and stuff. So. Yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, you know, maybe maybe I might have hope to get him on here yet. Who knows? Well, uh, yeah. 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 Talk about New Year's Evil. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. New Year's Evil. Yeah. Ron Kelly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Aiden Chan. 
Yeah, that was a good little band, actually. That yeah, you had that was in that movie. They made some. Uh, they, made, they they had a couple of hits over in uh, in England, actually. They, they did pretty well. There you go. Well, Stefan, it was absolutely wonderful right. having you on here. Uh, that was one. Celebrating 40 years of uh, of uh, good uh, ethnic uh, class attendance at Central <laughs> Tech, <laughs> and hopefully Lincoln, in- Lincoln High. Lincoln High. So oh, that's it. right, Lincoln High. That's right. We're supposed to we're supposed to think about that. Lincoln High. Toronto is Chicago. <laughs> I'm never thinking about Chicago. I'm just thinking it opens with an Alice Cooper song. There you go. Alice Cooper and Lalo Schifrin, boy. How's that for weird? Alice writes the words and Lalo Schifrin. Lalo Schifrin composed like the Mission Impossible theme and and all these different big television themes and everything. And he writes this thing with Alice. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Here you go. All right, Greg. Thanks God, a lot. God bless you. Thank you so much, Stefan. It's always a pleasure. You bet. See you soon. <laughs> Take it easy, man. You too. Bye bye. Bye now. Yep. <laughs>